Hi everyone, my name is Marko Suvejic and today I will talk about emerging technologies and humanity. And when I say emerging technologies and humanity, um, I really am referring to a large umbrella term that uh, kind of encompasses these two basic categories. Uh, and those two basic categories are almost like a simplified version of Maslow's pyramid of needs that you're probably familiar with. That on one side, we have um, a care for our body, for our health. And that tends to be our primary involvement because if we're not healthy, if we're not doing good, if we feel uh, scared for our safety, uh, it is hard to do anything else. That becomes very much primary thing. However, once we achieve that, once we do have a body that is okay and you know we're feeling relatively safe, the other category kind of kicks in, which is the uh, desire for being inspired, desire for having a meaningful experience. So today I'll be talking about how emerging technologies have affected or affecting, as we talk about it, uh, these two categories. And um, one thing I wanted to kind of reiterate when I talk about emerging technologies, I really mean that. Emerging as of like present continuous, as of what is happening today, meaning that as, we, as I speak, so sometimes in the future, these emerging technologies will be established, mature technologies, and we probably will already have some ideas of what do we want to use them for, how are we want to you know, implement them. But right now, we are kind of looking at new technologies and trying to figure out exactly what is it that we can do with them. Um, and in doing so, I am choosing, in a way, two emerging technologies and their influences with these two categories. So on one side, it's virtual reality and its influence on healthcare, um, and combining that with another emerging technology of blockchain and its influence on inspiration or as represented by art. Um, interestingly enough, as I was thinking about this, we can actually literally crisscross those technologies and we could just as easily talk about the role of blockchain in healthcare and the role of virtual reality and art. So again, these are somewhat uh, choices that use to give us an example to explore both these two areas of health and inspiration and within that, these two technologies. Um, obviously, VR being a little bit more established um, with much longer history, but only in the last three plus years can kind of, you know, VR has come to the fore with more uh, user-friendly devices and we're now kind of starting to use it on a more massive scale. And with the blockchain in a similar way, um, obviously technology that is about 10 years old now, since 2009, and the first white paper that was um, penned by Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, the founder of Bitcoin, but only in the last three years or so has blockchain technology been kind of started to use, to be used for, uh, you know, applied to other um, uses. So those are the two things that we will explore together today. Um, so the first topic is the virtual reality and uh, applications for health. And um, I'll talk both about general use, but also use a prism of my own research and my own work to kind of present uh, what is being done uh, today. Now, uh, my research in the world of virtual reality uh, is kind of focused on this interaction between what I call virtual reality and veritable or verified or validated reality. Validated reality being the reality that we're sharing right now together. Um, and I'm not gonna go into the side conversation that is always possible of is this validated reality really reality or are we living in a world of you know, Maya as Sanskrit would put it or as Elon Musk says, you know, chance of one in 50 million that we are actually not living in a simulated reality. So for the purposes of this research, I'm referring to validated reality as reality that we experience every day, and then that relationship with virtual reality. And one of the key uh, words here is the key word of presence. And presence uh, describes this sense that when we put a virtual reality set, 
feeling into that space, feeling into the space that, oh, I really believe that I'm virtual reality, or that I'm in real, that my validated reality becomes what was given to me by the VR headset. And in that transition is where most of my research is focused. Um, to date, virtual reality has been used in the hospitals. Uh, it has been uh, used very successfully to primarily affect uh, perception of pain, to lower the perception of pain. Uh, it has been used for treating burn victims, especially when the, it's necessary to kind of sidetrack the mind and not be focused when a painful therapy might be uh, applied. Um, and you know, in, 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 in such a case, we did a, our own research at the Chance Hospital, UF Health in Florida. It's one of the biggest uh, hospitals in Florida. And um, we started realizing that we are affecting three different uh, characteristics. Um, perception of pain, quality of sleep, and cognitive deterioration with our VR app. And just so happens that those three things are the three things that really affect the onset of delirium. Um, we were working primarily with the patients in an um, ICU unit, intensive care unit. So delirium is something that is really a big problem um, where almost 50% of ICU patients develop some uh, type of delirium. So we're working to introduce virtual reality therapy for ICU patients that prevents, among other things, the onset of delirium. So with the Project DREAMS, um, which is acronym and stands for Digital Rehabilitation Environment Augmenting uh, System, we're looking to introduce mindfulness and meditation ultimately as a therapy for accepting the reality as is and applying the therapy to the ICU patients in a state when they are not as agitated. So in other words, um, let's say we would like to introduce meditation or relaxation techniques to the hospital patients. Well, many patients are older. Many of them are, almost most of them are in severe pain. Um, they are in ICU units that usually have lights on 24 seven. There's a lot of machines, people going in and out. And it's really hard to kind of remove oneself from where you are. Uh, you know, you kind of, every once in a, you know, every few minutes there is kind of a interruption of one's you know, presence in that, in that room. So uh, by introducing virtual reality, what we do, we take these uh, patients away from where they are. This is a main menu of our prototype app. And you can kind of see it, you know, it's a combination of you can choose your location, choose your background music, and then the experience, which is the voiceover uh, guided meditation that we work with mindfulness meditators, uh, that would then guide the patient into a relaxing state of mind. So they can choose a variety of different locations, like beach or forest or you know, variety of places. So far, beach seems to be the most popular. Um, and from here, what we do, I would take somebody's mind, we we'll apply re initial relaxation. Usually, we actually do a quick app that introduces them to the VR in general. Um, just so they understand where they are. And then it will be about 15 minute guided meditation. And within the guided meditation, what we're looking to do is to create that sense of presence and to create that sense of taking somebody's mind away from the reality that at that moment is not very supportive. It's a ICU room, right? And take it somewhere else, like a beach or any place that that person would feel comfortable and allow to relax. So they have noise canceling headphones, a VR set, and all of a sudden they are being moved away from a hospital and put somewhere else. Um, within that uh, reality, what happens is that um, f at first, and this is kind of how the voiceover goes, at first we will say things like, hey, take a look around you if you know beach, look at the sand beach, hear the seagulls. So the voice actually affirms and confirms what the user is seeing. Um, it helps, again, that sense of presence. They're like, oh, 
there's somebody else seeing what I'm seeing, even though it's just a voiceover. It really works uh, in, in kind of allowing it to like, oh, OK, I'm really here. And then after a minute or so, I'll asking them to like, OK, and now focus your attention to your breath. That's one of the exercises. It's, there's a breathing exercise. So within that exercise, then, there are parts when we would ask users to, let's say, close their eyes. And it's interesting, because these are kind of things that could be almost considered a little you know, small nuances, but it's what makes the therapy work. We're, we're kind of used to, we're conditioned to think about that you know, I'm now seeing the world around me. And I close my eyes, and now I'm inside my own mind and my own head. And I'm expecting that when I open my eyes, I will be back into reality. So when you, somebody puts a virtual reality headset on and starts meditating at the beach, and then they're asked to close their eyes, and for a part of the experience, they have their eyes closed, even though they still have a VR headset. And even if they cheat, they open and they're on oh, their beach. OK, and they close their eyes. And then when they're asked to open their eyes, they're back to the beach. And that really kind of confirms that they are really at the beach. The mind really feels like, oh yeah, I open up my eyes, and this is where I am. Ah, OK. And then they continue with their meditation experience. right? And it is that moment of taking the consciousness in a way, taking the mind to another location, applying the therapy while mind is calm. Instead of being agitated uh, in a hospital, but mind is calm and receptive of such therapy. And once the therapy is done, allowing mind to come back, taking off the VR set, coming back into this world, hopefully stronger and calmer. Followed by that, we, uh, we would have an exit. You know, this, this will be a two times a day for a certain amount of days that we would track our uh, progress. And, um, we would talk to patients about their ability to continue doing this even without VR. So they can do this without a VR set. And um, actually, we have a lot of patients who express an interest to get a VR set so they can have that aid even when they leave the hospital. Now, uh, as I talk about it, uh, here are three questions or three arguments on why would we use these kinds of tools um, in healthcare. So, the three arguments are apps as an observational tool, scaling, and then the immersion and sense of presence in VR. Um, and this is really a much wider argument, not just for VR, but using video games, interactive uh, systems in um, healthcare. Because uh, number one, app can become an observational tool for us, meaning that um, it is not easy to have somebody always present who tracks how a patient is doing, right? Um, it's actually quite expensive for nurse to go and do something um, every day or every hour or every few hours. That's quite expensive. However, as soon as the app is on, it's actually tracking how somebody is interacting. And particular types of interactions can be yellow flags. And literally, it becomes an assessment tool that is almost hidden in a, in a format of a game or a virtual reality um, experience. Number two is scaling. Um, I mentioned already how difficult it is to have or how expensive it is to have nurses check very often. It takes about 30 minutes for a nurse to check for delirium. Um, and it probably happens once per day or every other day in most of the hospitals. So by having software powered um, assessment tools, we're, allow, you know, we're able basically to grow at scale and to assess these things twice a day, three times a day, or even more often. And argument number three, the biggest one for the virtual reality, is the sense of immersion um, and the sense of presence that I spoke about, you know, that sense that what we are seeing in the virtual world is real, that what we're seeing in virtual real, what we're experiencing is real. Um, and that is the basics of the research that I'm doing. Um, just the other day, I did, um, here in LA, I did Void VR, and um, we did a horror experience. It's a virtual reality kind of thing. Um, 
And, and, and you know, it, it, it really is scary. I don't really like horror, so, uh, but it really is scary. You have zombies coming at you. Uh, you have to run over a wooden plank and not fall down, you know, and then you get to the halfway and you're like, <gasps> and I mean, you know, there's nothing to the side, of course, but in, in the virtual reality, mine really plays that trick and makes it feel like as if there's really something there, right? Um, and that is what's really important in order to apply the therapy. If, if that sense of presence is not there, it will not work. So it's, it, it's really very, very important that we have that sense of presence. Again, we would take our consciousness, move it into the virtual reality, apply therapy, want, you know, calm the mind down, make it receptive towards the therapy, apply the therapy, and then allow the person to come back, right? Um, so one of, you know, as, as I mentioned before, uh, among many other uses of virtual reality in healthcare, one thing that we did at the Digital Worlds Institute and uh, University of Florida uh, have identified in collaboration with our colleagues from College of Medicine is the delirium is one of the things that we have not really experimented with. And we've been working on it now for a year and a half, um, conducting real hospital studies. We did two large studies with hospital patients. Um, when I say large, it's about 60 patients or so. For research purposes, that's relatively large. It takes a lot of um, administration and bureaucracy to get okay to work with live hospital patients that are in intensive care unit, meaning that they are potentially not gonna make it out of there alive, and to have an intervention that can impact how their healing goes, you know, will they survive or not? So that's really, really, um, that was challenging, one of the more challenging almost steps in this process. But um, the reception was great. Uh, we've been having uh, many, actually, uh, patients having great feedback on that. And now we're working on the next um, iteration on our, of our prototype that we're looking to create biofeedback connected to virtual reality. So what we do in this world actually um, affects what we see in the virtual reality um, world. Now, um, as for the next steps of this particular project, uh, where do we want to take it? Um, end of life care is one big area um, that we're thinking about. Basically, uh, the idea here is, you know, it's really special or nice if somebody at the end of the life gets an opportunity to say their goodbyes or to be surrounded by the loved ones. Um, but in a hospital situation, that's often not a case. Uh, quite often, people die on their own, alone, without anybody around. And it's a stressful experience. You know, you might know that you're going to die in the matter of days, and there's nobody around you. And it's a very cold and lonely experience. So we're looking at um, including virtual reality as a means to humanize this experience, uh, working with hospices where we can create personalized experiences for people towards the end of their life that they can you know, go back into their um, you know, photographs of their life, places they've been to, um, you know, images that would inspire them and calm them down and allow them some kind of a connection with their own life and their history that has been uh, there behind them at this very uh, sensitive time of their life. Um, another look into the future here when we talk about VR uh, is inspired by the work of the philosopher Roy Ascot when he talks about moist media. And moist media as a concept is a media that is created at the intersection of three VRs. And those three VRs are VR, virtual reality, which is kind of a cyber computer-aided reality, this being one of them, but any kind of uh, computer-aided reality. Uh, validated reality, which we spoke about already, um, reality that we perceive as real. And then vegetal reality. Vegetal reality talks about uh, medicinal plants, uh, plants like ayahuasca, uh, plants like um, mushrooms, peyote, that create psychedelic um, experiences that traditionally have been used for healing purposes. And it's been used in a variety of ways where either shaman would use it and the patient actually is not 
let's say, drinking ayahuasca, as it is a tradition in Amazon that has changed since, and now uh, patients are the ones who are drinking it. Um, to you know, many other forms, and as the future comes in, we start realizing that now we have this other form of guiding through virtual reality and having this situation where we have a real world and then virtual reality world and then this vegetal reality world and that there's somewhere on the intersection of those three world, worlds we find again what we refer to as moist media media that will create um, experiences at those at that intersection um, there is a lot of work already being done with psilocybin and PTSD, especially um, with the VA office, Veterans Affairs office, uh, and that work is really kind of coming about now and starting and being, for the first time, seen with a little bit different eye, not being judged. Um, and then another option that we're looking at is augmented reality. Uh, these are Magic Leap goggles, uh, where we're changing. So. <laughs> In virtual reality, we move somebody away from the validated reality, right? So I take a patient away from the room, I apply the therapy, and then bring them back into this reality. With augmented reality, it's a little bit different. You know, as you know, it functions with overlaying something, you know, augmented reality into where we are. So now we try to do something different in terms of instead of moving somebody out, applying therapy, bringing them back, how about can we make this reality more magical? Can we make somebody um, put the glasses on and be able to paint the room in which they're in? Create all kinds of you know, pictures and things like that so the room where they're in changes and becomes more human or you know, more approachable. And what's interesting is um, in our conversations with people who we did some initial tests here, uh, <laughs> They perceive it almost as if they will say things like, oh yeah, um, those things are still there, I just, don't, I just need those special glasses to see them. And for them, they're really there. Like they'll put things on, it's like, oh yeah, I just put in my special glasses and I, you, know, you can see everything, it's still there. Um, and it's been really interesting and I think as the technology moves forward for augmented reality, right now, you know, Magic Leap is quite expensive at $3,500 for the developer kit. Uh, but as that technology moves forward and the prices start going down, we'll start seeing a lot more um, uses of AR in um, health therapy as well. So those are some of the ideas of where we're looking to move the DREAMS project into the future, which really deals with digital um, rehabilitation environment um, you know, changing processes that we can do through technology. Now, um, I want to move now from healthcare to inspiration. So I talked a little bit about VR. I talked about how we can help our bodies, how we can heal, how we can stay healthy. Um, I want to jump to the second topic of blockchain and art. Um, in this particular case, I'm going to talk about blockchain art, art about blockchain, and blockchain facilitated art markets. Um, you probably have all heard about Bitcoin, about blockchain, read about it a little bit, and art is probably one of the areas that maybe very few people have explored in relationship to blockchain. So it's a little bit of a niche topic right now that is becoming bigger and bigger as we speak. So um, my work in this area um, is under the umbrella of Global Blockchain Initiative that I have started at the University of Florida. And we are working on applied research. So unlike maybe computer science departments where we uh, work on the actual protocols or um, the actual maybe different cryptocurrencies or something, things like that, we're looking at applied research of what can be done with these new technologies and also how can we spread the word, we're educational um, institution primarily, right? So the two steps that I am charged with as a researcher and a professor, number one is generation of new knowledge, and number two is spreading that knowledge to students. So it's kind of a really one, two step. You know, I spend half of my time looking to generate new knowledge that has not been there before, and then testing it, putting it to rigorous testing, and then applying it and 
um, sharing it with other researchers and my students. Now, uh, blockchain as such really offers very interesting um, opportunities, especially for conceptual art. Um, I remember when network art or internet art started happening um, in the late 90s, I was living in San Francisco, and I remember uh, around 2000, SF MoMA uh, put up the very first show that dealt with network art. It was called, I believe, 010101.org. And um, leaving that show, actually, the thing that I remembered was that the whole sections were sectioned off with this yellow tape saying, oh, you know, the system is down, uh, no internet here, stuff like that. It was very touchy artwork, you know, where half of stuff would not really work. And that's part of being emerging technology, right? Anything that is a Gen 1, it doesn't really kind of work always um, out of the box as, as, as we would think about it. But also artists take that and take it places where maybe initial researchers and creators did not even think about um, using it, right? So in this particular uh, set of examples, I'll talk about art about blockchain, meaning art that has blockchain as a um, topic, as a focus. So it's a traditional art, but it kind of comments on blockchain in a way. Um, number two is blockchain as means of payment and purchase tracking, crowd, uh, crowd financing art, meaning using blockchain again as a tool to either buy, sell, or register ownership or register that a uh, work of art is really uh, original. And number three is blockchain art. And blockchain art is art that uses blockchain as medium. Uh, so it's the type of art that, would, that did not exist 10 years ago, right? Because it needed, uses blockchain as sculpture uses clay or stone. So this is the division that I have um, seen in, when I think of how blockchain and art interact with each other, these are the three categories that to date we can kind of categorize things in, right? Commentary on it, um, using it as a business kind of sense, and then using it as the medium for art itself. Um, this is an example of an artist that kind of made a relatively um, big name. His name is Crypto Graffiti, and um, he does both art about blockchain and blockchain art, but most of his pieces literally are art about blockchain. So these are just different examples um, of his pieces that, um, let's say, on the top row, we have a person who for a while was claiming, or we thought it could be the Satoshi Nakamoto, the author of Bitcoin. So he used that, and um, to create this collage, he used cut up credit cards. So the credit cards obviously had to be of particular color, and he would collect them and cut them up and made this collage that is also a commentary both on what is coming and what it was. The commentary of, hey, these credit cards are useless. You know, in, in tomorrow, we will not need this anymore. This is like an old banking system that is going to be gone soon, and we're going to have something completely different, um, and then presenting Satoshi or the person who at one point kind of became almost like a meme of uh, who Satoshi can be. Um, and again, without going into the details of the true identity of Satoshi Nakamoto that we do not know, there are guesses out there, there are guesses that maybe it's a group of people, that he never existed, that he died. Um, it just kind of depends on where, where do we stand on, on, on that. Um, level of arguments. But here's an example of art about blockchain, a comment, commentary on blockchain uh, by an older medium. Um, this is um, the world's first um, monument to Bitcoin. It's in Slovenia, in Krajn. And it's about seven meters wide, a few tons. Um, and this is kind of an aerial view of this uh, crossroad that has a Bitcoin logo put in it. So again, this was done a couple of years ago. Um, and it's, a, again, artwork that glorifies or uh, enshrines or archives the upcoming development of Bitcoin, be it one way or another. But again, it's art that uses blockchain as a commentary in many ways. 
Um, next is a blockchain art, or an art market, where there are at least three ways in which I can see blockchain disrupting the art market. Uh, number one is driving digital art sales up through digital scarcity. Because right now, and this was a big problem with digital art in general, where I'm a trained as a photographer, let's say, and in the late 90s, it was the last generation who used film, um, where you have some level of original pho photograph. But even then, that was a big problem, right? We have painters who would do a painting, and the painting by its very nature is uh, original. And then we have a photograph that have a negative that is kind of uh, original. And then I can make endless copies as prints. And then I have to kind of number those prints to make them limited portfolio or something like that. But it's really self-imposed. And I can make more prints. And um, it really kind of creates a challenge. Um, that different, let's say, photographers dealt in a different ways throughout their career. Uh, one of the famous photographers here from uh, California, Brett Weston, who was also a master printer, um, what did, he did, and this is mid 20th century, um, when he was, when he died, he willed that all his negatives need to be burned and destroyed, which was kind of, you know, he was. Those negatives were beautiful, and he's an amazing photographer. But he could not stand the idea of somebody else's hands touching his negatives and making prints in a way that he did not intend them. Uh, so he printed. He was a master printer. He printed his work. And they don't have, it doesn't have to be numbered anymore, right? It, what he made, he made. And that's it. And even if there's 30 copies, OK, those are the 30 copies. And there's never going to be another one, because those negatives do not exist anymore. However, if I make something now in digital photography, I mean, we can just copy paste it endlessly. If I create something in virtual reality, a 3D model, it's really hard to prove that that is the original. And this is where blockchain comes in now, that we can actually tie digital files and register in a blockchain and check for its authenticity. So for the first time ever, we can actually have digital files that we can prove that they are originals. Uh, it doesn't mean that you cannot screenshot it. You can, but you cannot sell it because you do not have a proof of uh, ownership, right? And that's a really huge deal that is going to uh, have a revolutionizing effect on digital art. Um, and, that, and really, we'll look at this 20, 30 years of having all analog art that is by nature, again, original. And then having digital art for 20, 30 years that kind of struggled by, with the sense of what is original, what is not, and having this kind of a hyper production where you know, up to the end of the 20th century, if you're a photographer, you were kind of a magician. You, you do this thing, and you go to a dark room, and you make these special things. And today, just about everybody who owns a phone has a camera. And we all become photographers. And, and it really changed things, um, sometimes for good, sometimes not so much, maybe. Um, number two is democratizing fine art investments, or making actually art investment available for everybody. So let's say I want to own a Picasso. Well, I might not have $3 million to buy one, but maybe I can get together enough people that we can buy it together. And we can have self-executing contracts on blockchain that prove our ownership. And I can sell my stake in this Picasso uh, just as much as I can sell my stock in a company or something like that. So it allows people who otherwise would never be able to enter the world of fine art investment because of the amounts necessary to enter that and to say, you know what? I think that this painting, the value will go up. And I'm going to invest in it. And I can invest $1, $100, $10,000, whatever. But I own it. It's provable. It is on, written on a blockchain. And I can do whatever I want with my shares. So it becomes almost like a stock um, that of ownership of a, of a digital art or real art, right? Um, and 
Again, number three is combination with number one, which is impro improving provenance and reducing art fo forgery. That, you know, proving the ownership of a particular piece of art. Um, this is a graph that was revealed, that was published last year. And it shows um, the plans into the future, and it was divided by galleries, auction houses, and intermediaries of are they looking into using virtual currency? And it kind of shows that we're still far from the wider acceptance, where 80% of people in all three categories says they have no intention of including cryptocurrency in the next um, year or two. Right? Uh, some will say in the future, but not in the near future. And this makes sense. Um, it makes sense primarily because uh, right now, cryptocurrency has a lot of problems uh, that are on the nature of you know, how to make it fully legal. Um, do we understand what does it mean to use cryptocurrency? How would it affect me if I use it? Uh, how do I get taxed? Uh, things like that. You know, taxation is a really, really uh, big deal right now, and it's kind of unfolding in front of our eyes. So until some of those questions are kind of settled down, very few larger auction houses would be willing to accept cryptocurrency because now you get payment, let's say in Bitcoin, and the Bitcoin goes up, and then they want to get dollars, well, they have to pay taxes on the capital gain from the difference in value between what they, you know, when they got it versus when they cashed out. And that becomes just too scary for a lot of uh, traditional conservative uh, art houses. However, uh, one thing that changed a lot is that um, at one point in time, we started decoupling the idea of cryptocurrency and blockchain technology as um, technology that supports it. Obviously, there's no real decoupling. You know, There's no Bitcoin without blockchain. It's the technology that powers it. But uh, it was a really a great, actually, PR moment where uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies had a really bad name. Uh, they were used often for potentially uh, illegal activities. And people who did not know much about it really was scared about it. So by moving the spotlight into the blockchain technology, it created this situation where many people nowadays, when I talk to them, they will say, ah, you know, I, I'm not really crazy. I don't deal with the cryptocurrencies, but I love blockchain technology. And it's like, OK, you know, it, it allows this in um, for people to go in and say, yes, there, there's a technology that can be used for other things. And this can be also seen in this next graph uh, that shows that blockchain technology as such is far more interesting to all the three categories, galleries, auction houses, and intermediaries, where, as you can see, um, over, over two thirds of uh, auction houses are actively planning to use blockchain technology in the future. They are looking to engage um, because they see the value of it. They see the idea of, oh, wait a second, we can probably get prices much higher if we can open up bidding to the larger pool of people. So it's not just somebody who can afford $3 million Picasso, but maybe this group can get together, or you know, a few thousand people can get together, and we can raise money to buy that Picasso as our common investment. Right? Um, the last but not the least is the blockchain art. And this is kind of a, the most fun part in, in a way. Um, it's the art that uses blockchain technology as its medium. Here I have an example of Plantoid, uh, an art piece that was done in 2016 by an artist, Primavera de Filippi. And here we have this kind of a robotic looking flower that um, it has its own dedicated um, Bitcoin wallet. And you can tip it. You can basically give money. Um, and when it do, it does this kind of a um, light show, and it moves around. So it kind of um, mimics nature, where even in nature, flowers are beautiful to attract pollinators, right? Uh, so they kind of put up a show for pollinators to come in so they can spread their seed. In a similar way, here, it will do the similar beautiful dance if and the pollinator, in a way, becomes a human who comes by and uh, 
put some Bitcoin in that wallet. After it, the wallet becomes, accumulates enough money, it is given to another person to create another plantoid. So the idea here is that it kind of, it's the artificial life that is capable of reproducing itself by the means of accumulated wealth due to its own performance. So if I get to make the next plantoid, I have to make it fun enough that it's capable of raising enough money that it can reproduce itself. So if I don't make a nice uh, one that people really want to give money to, it will not reach that point of reproduction, so to say. So um, an interesting way of using blockchain again to um, mimic how biology uh, operates. The Discover Da Vinci, this is a project that we are working on right now at Digital Worlds Institute. Uh, we're making um, kind of a collecting card game that at the same time um, this talks about the life of Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, we are celebrating 500 years of his uh, death this year. Um, and with this particular game, um, we are using a gamified experience. In this particular case, we're using Steam um, blockchain, um, mostly because Steam is very well suited for this type of a social interactions, voting, um, and things like that. But it's a card game where somebody collects cards of Leonardo's inventions. Um, and every time you collect uh, these cards, there are kind of a pop-up questions that you have to answer in order to unlock it. So it's a card collecting game where you can trade cards, but in order to unlock them, you have to answer these questions, which ultimately are the educational part. So it was built as uh, a means of promoting Leonardo da Vinci's work, primarily among the students on the University of Florida campus. It's, going, it, it's something that's being literally built as we speak right now. Uh, we're looking at a launch date in this fall. It, it, will be, it will be open for everybody, but primarily we are uh, pushing it towards our students. Um, and we'll be on mobile devices connecting uh, blockchain technology with AR because you'll be able to, once you collect and put together an um, innovation, you can kind of click on it and there will be an AR of that um, piece in the space on your mobile device that you can kind of explore, turn around, uh, play with it. So it combines certain uh, technologies into one experience that is primarily, again, um, educational, but in the form of a video game. Um, probably many people have heard of CryptoKitties. This is one of the first big names that came about in blockchain space. Uh, CryptoKitties is a card collecting game. Um, we can compare it to the, let's say, baseball cards or something like that. However, what was really unique here is that uh, with most digital art, if I made, let's say, a CryptoKitty or kitten like this, and I own one, well, how do I really own one? I mean, somebody else can have the same image and then now we both own one and what does that really mean? Well, in this particular case, um, owning a CryptoKitty literally means having the access code to a particular, uh, to a par to a particular number that identifies a CryptoKitty. And CryptoKitty becomes just literally illustration of that number that I have unique access codes to. So that gives me the ownership over, it literally gives me ownership over a blockchain address that is represented by the CryptoKitty. Um, this particular project actually was the first project that crashed Ethereum blockchain. It runs on Ethereum. And uh, it literally brought, uh, crashed the Ethereum network for a while because how popular has uh, become at, at the time of its launch. And this is 2017, and um, when, when I look at this and think about it, you know, just 20 years earlier, um, I was working on other type of virtual uh, pets. Uh, these were virtual pets, virtual cats and dogs um, that were developed by the company called PF Magic in the 90s. And I worked for the PF Magic at the time as a webmaster, moving virtual pets online. And this is online when we didn't really know. That was when internet was emerging technology. And we literally would have meetings like, so we have this internet thing, and 
what are we going to do with it? Like we have a video game and we have, and what do we do with this? Um, so we would have brainstorming sessions talking about uh, things we can do. And surprisingly enough, it was our users who were the most creative ones. And we learned um, really soon after because these pets had artificial intelligence engine in them um, that people started opening online businesses. And this is 97, 98. Uh, online businesses being, oh, I'll train your pet. You upload your file, I train it, you download it, pay me $2. Or uh, in cats too, and cats and dogs too, you were able to uh, mate two dogs or two cats. And uh, if the mom and dad were highly trained AIs, the baby will be easier to train. So people started opening online stud services. Um, so it was really kind of fascinating, you know, th th where people took this, um, but very, very much uh, unexpected. And then this kind of brings back um, this idea of emerging technologies that what is emerging today um, in 20 years, we'll look at it differently. This was very much emerging in 1997, having virtual pets, having um, idea of AI, interacting with it. Uh, well, you know, now we're talking about CryptoKitties. So um, with this slide, I would like to um, finish my part and um, ask for any questions or comments. Um, we have about five to 10 minutes to um, discuss any questions that you may have. Anyone have any questions? I love the cube. So um, when the pa patients are exiting the virtual realities, mm -hmm. What kind of effort do you put to like, slowly ramp them back up to taking off the virtual reality? Mm -hmm. So there are, two, um, there are two steps, actually, that are very sensitive in, in that regard. And you identified the first one, um, which is actually literally taking it off and kind of having that jarring moment. So um, one of the things that we do work on is, in, again, um, that kind of a, there's a lead in to the experience and then lead out. So it actually in informs the user that they are about to take off the virtual, you know, so it kind of tells them what's to come and that really helps. And that it was something that um, we kind of discovered as we worked on this, you know, we went in and it was, we didn't have it in, in, initially and there were, it was like, oh, and it was almost kind of like a crash. It was like, I'm back here. You know, can I, can I be permanently there? Um, so, and that's part of the, the research effort is that, oh, um, how to help out, how to make that transition go well. Uh, the second part that was really difficult also was that um, as the researchers, we had to conduct a questionnaire and all these tests. So now we will have a patient who takes off their thing and they're kind of like almost in a semi-sleepy state and we're, it's exactly what I want him to be, right? And I want him to be there for a while. And instead, it's like, all right, and now we have a questionnaire for you. So um, one through five stars, how would you rate your experience? One through five stars. And it's like, what? And it was really jarring to the point where the questionnaire often um, would like last 20 minutes, which is longer than the actual experience in the VR. So we had to cut down the questionnaire to be much shorter. Uh, but in the same time, we cannot totally eliminate it because the whole purpose of it is to collect data. So it's a kind of thing that we as researchers have to kind of balance, you know, and understand that I'm actually affecting the very outcomes that I'm looking to do because in the afternoon I'll come back and ask again those questions before and after the experience. Um, so it, it's a it's a bit of a touchy job there. And that's also what um, led us to this idea of experimenting with augmented reality, which doesn't have that. You know, it's like, oh, I'm still here. It's just that if I put a special magic glasses, it's a really fun room that is colorful rather than a white neon um, room. But um, it makes that trans, it's like, oh, how to make this a nicer place rather than how to escape from here to somewhere else. So it's a two different approaches, and I believe that there are opportunities uh, in healthcare for both. There's another question there. 
Hi, uh, for the dreams therapy, um, has your team explored, I guess, like stimulating the other senses, like maybe like aromas or having a fan that simulates a breeze? Yeah, so um, we have evaluated different options. Um, and again, it's a interesting situation where, you know, when I started working on this about two years ago, I had all kinds of ideas what I wanted to do. And my collaborator, who um, is a doctor at, who works in ICU, she kind of listened to me and she listened to me and she's like, okay, um, I want you to go and be 10 days in ICU and then we can have this conversation again. I was like, no, but I was like, I don't want to talk about this anymore, go to ICU. So I spent 10 days in ICU, uh, shadowing, doing some off the shelf you know, projects with, with, with people. Um, and there were a lot of challenges that I didn't even know existed before. Um, such as, oh, you cannot have Velcro in the ICU unit because it collects bacteria. Um, so there were so many limitations that for me to, let's say, introduce um, smell, I would have a whole, I mean, it's an interesting, but it completely changes the nature of what am I, what is it? I'm actually giving something to the patient that could be dead tomorrow. Um, so it creates a lot of very specific cases that we have to say, all right, right now we're gonna work on this. Once that is proven useful, we can expand it by adding very one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. Otherwise, uh, it's hard to measure what is um, affecting it. And early on with this kind of work, it's, it, it's challenging. So what we're really looking at, you know, what I really am excited about now is connect, not necessarily adding more senses um, as much as adding interactivity. Adding that maybe one's voice or breathing um, can actually affect what's happening in the app, right? Because most of the meditation apps out on the market right now, you just kind of watch it and you follow it. And if you don't follow it, it just kind of goes on and you can follow it or not. But to have a gamified meditation where I'm measuring the heartbeat, I'm measuring the breath, and if you're doing good, the game is opening up for you. And if you're not, it's not. You know, looking to kind of facilitate the interaction through interactivity. Hi, so uh, I saw in the art slides that there is an intermediary and they were considering using blockchain in the future. And I was wondering why they would want to use it when blockchain takes out in any intermediaries and the, um, the person providing a service can directly give that service to anyone in the blockchain. Yeah, it's, um, <laughs> it, it, I think it's a paradox that currently a lot of people are trying to figure out. Um, you know, when we talked about cryptocurrencies, um, we said, oh, banks are going to be made obsolete. Yet what happened is banks created you know, their own cryptocurrencies now and are going into that. So I think it's happening in, in two ways. On one part is certain types of business practices will be made obsolete and we will not need a middle person anymore. And it will also create the different types of middle people, middle you know, persons who will do things that do not exist right now. And I think a certain amount of businesses are looking to reinvent themselves and say, oh, well, nobody's going to be needing these services anymore. But what if we are maybe um, aggregator of anybody interested in investing in an art piece through our, you know, through our coin? Um, and they become, again, a middle person that is not necessary, but it really helps. Like, I can, how, if I want to own Picasso, how do I really go about it? I understand that there's, you know, but, oh, there is a website and they have an offer, which ones I can do. And they become kind of a intermediary that is not necessary, but it's nice. It's almost like a mountain guide. I can make it to the top on my own, but it's kind of nice to have somebody. So I think that a lot of, art-related businesses are looking to figure out how to stay relevant. And I think sometimes it feels like, wait a second, I'm working on making myself obsolete. And um, I, as a professor right now, online teaching is, you know, online courses are all the rage. And all of my classes right now, I'm recording for online audience. So I would give a presentation at, you know, to the live audience and then go in a studio and talk again the same thing. And as I do it, it feels kind of like, huh, and when I'm finished with this, they don't need me anymore. They just 
I, I literally just made myself obsolete. So it's a, just kind of a comparison. I feel like, oh, these middlemen are doing things that they feel like, I hope that there is a future beyond this because I'm literally right now making myself obsolete. But if I don't do it, I'm going to be obsolete for sure. So I'm kind of hoping that I'm going to learn things that going forward will make me actually far more relevant than um, I was before in this new economy. Yeah. All right, let's give a round of thanks to Marco. That was a great talk. <laughs>